Welcome to Whiteboard Crypto, the number one YouTube channel for crypto education. And here we explain topics of the cryptocurrency world using analogies, stories, and examples so that anyone can easily understand them. In this video, we're going to explain why almost all play to earn games die and what needs to change for them to become sustainable. This video is going to cover four reasons why all these games die, but let's get into the most obvious one first. The money must come from somewhere. When it comes to play to earn games, the idea is pretty simple. You play the game and you earn money. Well, where does that money come from? To keep players playing, it would seem that you would need to keep paying them. Now, there are tons of ways you can pay these loyal players, but let's go through a few different ideas now. Number one, new players. Many play to earn games follow this model, whereby money is pumped into the system by a new player required to buy an item. For example, to play Axie Infinity, you must buy an Axie, which is a character used in the game. When someone buys an Axie, they are putting money into the game that is then, through a series of transactions, possibly cashed out by another player. This is not sustainable because there is no case where every player has made money. If one player makes money, it is made from the money that another player has invested or injected into the game. Almost all play to earn games work this way. Avogachi, the step and shoe NFT game, Zed Run, the horse racing game, all of these work by taking money from new players and giving it to older loyal players. So this just isn't a good idea. Let's move on to where the money can come from number two, a membership model. Another way these games can raise money is through a membership model where they charge all players a set fee to participate and play the game. This is a much better model than the previous model because it means the fee is equal for for all players. In the previous example, someone with $10,000 to play the game automatically has an advantage over someone who only has $100, giving wealthier players an unfair advantage. A membership model would look like a seasonal membership fee that is the same for all players, where the skillful players will win the money that the skillless players paid in. To me, this is a much more fair model, but it also leaves a ton of money on the table, which is probably why many protocols don't even consider it. It's also much easier to market that when you pay $100 to buy an Axie, you get to keep that Axie as something that you own, compared to a $20 seasonal fee to play the game that expires once the season is over. The next model is called pay to win. Another revenue option is the pay to win route. Now this one's pretty obvious and we see it in some games like Minecraft where you can spend a few hundred dollars to jumpstart your way to hard earned tools and items. Because this is seen as giving rich players an unfair advantage, some other games raise revenue this way but instead of giving things that are useful like items or tools, they instead give other useless things like a different skin or the option to change your username or just the ability to flex by changing how you look. Up until now, these three models that I just explained aren't really good options for the users. This brings us to model number four, advertisements. So the next option, or at least the best option that I can think of is an advertisement model. Similar to how Apple advertises at large football stadiums, maybe Razer or Logitech could pay a game to advertise in their PVP arenas. Now this is outside money coming into a game and it's not from lower skilled players and it's also not from the hope of speculative investors making money. Money. In fact, it's an actual business model. The play to earn game could have a few advertisements throughout the game that raises monthly revenue, of which some of that could be portioned off for skillful players to reward them for playing, and the rest could go to the devs to continue to develop the game. Thus, the development team has an incentive to build a game that attracts a lot of users. The players have a sustainable way to actually earn money while they play, at least if they're good, and most importantly without taking it from the skillless players, and these advertisers get a new paid advertising route that may be really effective for their goals. For a play to earn game to actually be sustainable, for it to succeed 10 years from now, the money that the players are earning must also be sustainable. And if you pay players with money that is received from new players, the game will die over time. It's very much like a Ponzi scheme and it will not make it to 10 years because the players will quickly be divided into those who made money and those who lost money and you will eventually run out of new players. So anyways, that's problem number one. Play to earn games just keep running out of money to pay their play to earn players. The next big problem is that play to earn games aren't really fun. Let's think about some of the world class, well known games that have lasted years and years of being played. World of Warcraft, League of Legends, Ruinscape, Minecraft, Call of Duty, Skyrim, Candy Crush, Pokemon, Clash of Clans, Subway Surfer. These games have stood the test of time because they are literally fun to play. Now let's take a look at some of the GameFi games, Axie Infinity, Avogachi, DeFi Kingdoms, 
These games lack functionality and a certain psychological edge to make these games fun once you take away the earning part. Even more so, think about it like this. Would you pay Axie Infinity money to play their game? What about DeFi Kingdoms? Would you pay them to play that game? The answer is no. That's because these games are not fun. They don't create an experience. Now, how do we know those traditional games that I listed earlier are fun? It's because people pay those companies millions of dollars every year to keep playing them. And they expect, and even more so, they don't even expect a monetary return. So this is a fundamental difference between a lot of play-to-earn games and sustainable traditional games. Play-to-earn games right now simply aren't fun. A ton of play-to-earn games are basically just financial ideas where the marketers have tried to add in a game aspect to attract users, i.e. customers. And we won't see great GameFi adoption until this is reversed, not until we have fun games that then add in aspects of a blockchain where needed. Then we will have a sustainable GameFi game. Even more so, games probably shouldn't be paying their users anyways, and this kind of brings us to our next problem. Problem number three is the old man. Now to explain this next problem, which is psychological in nature, I'm going to be telling you a story. It's not a real story, but you'll understand how it applies to crypto games. So first off, there's a bus corner where this school picks up a group of kids for school early in the morning. And on that same corner is an older man who sits outside his house to sip his morning coffee. Anyways, one morning while these kids are waiting on the bus, they started making fun of that older man who was just sitting there and he heard them. A whole week goes by of these jokes and the old man eventually gets tired of it. So he comes up with a genius plan. He waits until the next school day and he tells these kids, Hey, come here. For every joke that you tell about me, I'm going to give each one of you a dollar. Now, these kids were absolutely delighted. They were doing this for free, and now they'll get paid for insulting the young man. How stupid could he be? So, the next day rolls around, and they come up with a clever joke, and the old man gives each one of them a dollar. A few days goes on, and the old man says, This is getting too expensive, so from now on, I'm only going to be giving you 50 cents per joke now. The kids obviously weren't happy about it, but they agree and continue making fun of the old man. More days go by, and the old man once again reduces the joke payout to 25 cents, then to 10 cents, and eventually to a nickel. Then, finally, the kids approach the man with a joke, and the old man tells them he can only give them one penny. The kids are so frustrated, they yell at the old man. No way we're doing this. We used to do this for a whole dollar. And from that day on, the kids never joked about the old man again, even though they used to do it for free. Can you see how this story applies to crypto games? Some games are fun to play just for free. Then we add a financial incentive to them, and we suddenly have a secondary motive. Now, imagine if you were paid $100 per month to play a game, and then $50, and then it kept going down until you made $1 per month just to play the game. It's not going to seem as much fun because you would compare your earnings back to when you earned $100 a month. In fact, YouTubers fall prey to this all the time. Many creators spend a long time creating a bunch of videos. They finally get their big break, they go viral, earn a bunch of money, and then they experience burnout when they create better content, but they don't get the same amount of views or the same amount of ad revenue due to outside forces. The psychological term for this is that external rewards will reduce internal motivation, even when the external reward is taken away and game developers should be very thoughtful when designing incentive mechanisms involving money. Let's move on to problem number four. Now the last reason why almost all play to earn games die, or rather why most crypto games go extinct, is because they have no need to be on the blockchain. In many cases, the users want them to be on the blockchain, or the developers want them to be on the blockchain, but in reality, they don't need to be on the blockchain. Now to summarize this problem, I'm gonna use an analogy. First, you should know that blockchain technology solves a few very specific problems. However, just because blockchain solves some problems well, doesn't mean it solves all problems well. Think about a wheel. A wheel works great on a car because it allows the car to travel much faster with less resistance than if the car had square wheels or if the car had no wheels at all. Even more so, wheels are actually pretty good on trucks because they're pretty similar to cars. And wheels are even great on lawnmowers for much of the same reason. However, to continue our analogy, wheels are not that good on submarines. Even though they are a type of vehicle, they don't really need wheels to function well, since they're mostly underwater. Even more so, Wheels are not needed on a phone or a computer, and if you did add wheels to these devices, you might even say it creates a new problem. Just because wheels are great at solving some problems doesn't mean they're great at solving every problem, or that we should use them all the time. And the same is true of blockchain technology. 
Blockchains offer very specific solutions to a few certain problems. Without going on and on, the best games out there are already working fine without blockchain technology, and the players who are playing those games aren't really crying out for the need of blockchain technology. Therefore, blockchain games could be seen as adding wheels to a phone. Maybe they are just not needed. I will make a note here and say that there's probably two places where blockchains may help solve two specific problems in games. One place where they may fit well is in allowing users to own their own skins, or in-game items. However, many development companies make money by continuing to sell certain things to game users over and over again. If you need more money, you just make a new skin and then you sell it again. Some say that if you actually give users the ability to sell their in-game items and create a secondary marketplace, you're actually reducing the total number of customers for the game development studio. For example, why would I buy a $20 in-game cape from a game developer when I could instead buy a used one from another player for $8? And I think maybe the second place they would be useful would be in in-game marketplaces. But even so, this is just a single feature of a game and doesn't mean the entire game should be operated using blockchain technology. In both of these cases, the blockchain technology could be sprinkled in, but not built on top of. Wrapping it up, the reason a ton of play-to-earn games die is because of these four things. Number one, they don't have a sustainable way to keep paying their players. Number two, the games aren't fun whenever you take away the earn part. Number three, Human motivation is volatile when it's paired with fluctuating rewards. And number four, many games just don't need blockchain technology. As I end this video, I would love to see a conversation going on in the comment section below about what you think about this. Am I wrong? Do you have any rebuttals? Or maybe am I missing something? Drop a comment below and let me know what your thoughts are. Wrapping this up, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I really hope that maybe you've learned something. And most of all, I hope to see you in the next video. Oh, and also a little bonus note, Apple and Google are fighting very hard to make sure that there are no crypto games in their app store. Because of the huge fees that Apple and Google charge for some of these in-game purchases and app downloads. Crypto transactions are actually a huge competitor for them, so they're not going to be playing nice. This is probably why almost all play-to-earn games have been web-based and played in browsers and not mobile-based. Which is actually a much, much larger industry. Just something to think about.